Thank you very much, Mr. President. 110 million people. Yes. That's uh, uh, even for an Australian, I can work out that makes you the second most populous country in Southeast Asia. So, um, Indonesians out there. Yes. Philippines uh, next, with the great advantage, as you've just said, of having uh, 110 million native English speakers. This is quite remarkable. So, um, I'm really taken by the economic vision uh, that uh, you're putting forward for the country. In an earlier discussion today, you indicated there are some challenges still. Uh, the uh, digitalization of the economy has been slow. Uh, but in terms of the future, if you're looking at the digital economy, the renewable energy transformation, but also uh, future secure supply chains, Give us a sense of where you hope the country to be economically uh, at the completion of this term. Well, uh, to, put, to put it very simply, um, I've been asked what is the uh, um, absolute end result that uh, we are hoping to achieve. And it's very simple for me. No more, not one more hungry Filipino. And that is a very simple, it's, it's a very simple aim. It's a very simple goal. But I dare say it is not necessarily a, a simple uh, problem to solve. And it, uh, it requires a great deal of effort and, and, and uh, thinking on uh, the part of the public sector. But uh, if it is the public sector's uh, responsibility to uh, attend to that social problem that, uh, that we are facing. We are engaging, uh, this is the new policy of this administration, we are engaging the public sectors, uh, the private sector rather, as partners in that effort. We hope to uh, leverage whatever it is that the government can do uh, to maximize the effects of what uh, development we are able to, uh, we are able to encourage, and uh, to the benefit of those who have come to help us, our partners, our investors, and of course, to the benefit of the ordinary Filipino. And so, the, as, uh, as I came into office, of course, uh, the primary concern was the economy. The primary concern was the livelihood of Filipinos. And uh, this is why we have come to the conclusion with uh, economic managers who uh, we uh, have engaged and have asked to join government. We, I think, I believe that we have uh, the best and the brightest uh, of our economic managers, with uh, all of whom have a long history of success and a true understanding of the problems that Filipinos face, and furthermore, a true understanding of what we need to do to solve those problems. And again, we have managed uh, to engage our uh, public uh, private sector partners and uh, to be part of this effort. And uh, I do not think that uh, we could manage to do this by ourselves in the public sector. To take that, uh, to take that point a little further, I would say that uh, not only private sector partners in the Philippines, but also uh, partnerships between uh, governments and the Philippines as partners, as allies, as friends. As we all emerge uh, from the, uh, the pandemic and try to reinvigorate and transform our economy, I believe that the partnerships that we make between uh, our friends and allies around the world are going to provide the stability that we are going to need as we face a new world and face the problems really that we have not faced before the pandemic and we have not faced before and we now have to find new solutions. Business as usual in our view simply has no place in that because it is not business as usual. The pandemic basically has changed everything. We live differently, we work differently, we study differently, we, uh, our social contacts are done differently. And I can, as, as, as you can imagine, this leads now to that process of digitalization. 
that we all need to uh, undertake if we are going to be part uh, of the new global economy. And so many of these, uh, uh, many of these aspects of the economy have, um, we, we have tried to analyze it. And it is surprising for me anyway, that when we sat down with the economic managers and we talked about industrialization, we talked about energy supply, we talked about digitalization, and at the root of it, at the heart of the problem, was our agricultural sector. You would think that the high-tech industries would be the ones that would hold the key, and they do in many ways. But all that that we can do uh, with the, the new industries still have to be founded on a very strong and uh, reliable uh, agricultural sector. The pandemic showed very clearly the weaknesses that Philippines has in terms of uh, being able to provide a strategic food supply to our, to, our, to our countrymen at the price that they can afford. And so that, for us, has been really the first step, is uh, trying to improve the, rate, the, the production of uh, agricultural products, and, um, of course, this has been made terribly difficult with the shocks that the uh, agricultural sector, perhaps not just in the Philippines, but the, around the world, the shocks that have been dealt us by the conflict in Ukraine. It is a constant surprise to all of us, uh, but that we are having to learn to live with, that a conflict in Eastern Europe should affect the Philippines at such a profound and basic level as agriculture, with the prices of fertilizer going up, with the prices of uh, in, uh, agricultural, agricultural commodities going up, with uh, the uncertainties in, of supply. And so we now have to go to what we describe as non-traditional sources, and we have to diversify. I, I, I don't think that this... Uh, that this is unique to the Philippines. I see it in many of the other countries. So those are the first steps I think we'll have to do with the agriculture. And then we have to fix our weaknesses in the bureaucracy. We have to uh, learn to be more efficient. We have to streamline our uh, civil service, both at the national and at the local level. And uh, unfortunately, the Philippines in these, uh, in these areas, are st is st we are still playing catch up. Uh, but that's not what that's not where we want to go that's not just where we want to go we don't want to just catch up we want to go beyond that we have no interest in going back to pre-pandemic levels what we are interested in is to flourish further and to position the philippines in such a way that we can take full advantage of the new economies that and the new industries that have come to light. Unfortunately, the many of the traditional uh, sectors uh, have the, that we had depended on during the pan during pre-pandemic days uh, will cease to exist, have ceased to exist. And we have to identify as quickly as possible and to have a good view and forecast for the future to position the Philippines in such a way that uh, we are able to uh, be part of the transformation of the global economy. Thank you for that. <laughs> Mr. President, you mentioned a couple of times that uh, you're a treaty ally of the United States. So are we Australians. There are five of us in Asia. Sometimes the Americans can be tricky to deal with. How's, how's I, it, how's I, I don't think you'll, you, you'll get any contradiction from the Philippines uh, on that. <laughs> but they're good people, and uh, they've been reliable security partners. So tell me, uh, in a nutshell, how's it going with Uncle Sam? Because it wasn't going so well under President Duterte. Uh, <laughs> well, in a sense, uh, well, it never, in a sense... Despite the fact that uh, the, my predecessor, President Duterte, had a, a very different treatment of the uh, relationship between the U.S. and, uh, and the Philippines, uh, the basic premise of the strong relationship that has been developed between the U.S. and the Philippines over, 
over uh, more than 100 years uh, beyond the time that we had a formal diplomatic relationship. Uh, has, uh, is, is recognized as being as strong as it has ever been and, and that it is necessary, especially with the events of the past few weeks and months, maybe. Uh, where the, the, what, what has happened is that many times we, I had felt that in the, in the past years, uh, there was a feeling that we had come to a kind of modus vivendi in our region. And that is going that we you know we have found a way to live with each other in peace and found a way to uh, calm the waters whenever uh, things go awry a little bit. Uh, but again, the, the the events in the last in the last few months really have pointed out that those problems had not really gone away. They were just bubbling under the surface, and they now have come above the surface, and we have, to, we have to face those challenges, and we have to deal with them. So the United States, uh, the partnership between the United States and the Philippines is going to be certainly a very, very important part of uh, being able to manage uh, those problems that we have been facing. Uh, I think it is, uh, it's no surprise to anyone that uh, the Philippines uh, uh, has uh, some of these uh, some of these conflicts with the People's Republic of China, and uh, the position that the Philippines takes is that we have no territorial conflict with China. What we have are China claiming territory that belongs to the Philippines. So this is the, the position we take, and uh, with, our, with our American partners, we have, uh, we have uh, promoted that, uh, that position. We have also made it very clear to our friends in Beijing uh, that this is the way we feel about it. And uh, as, a, as a consequence of uh, this uh, challenge that we have, this diplomatic, this territorial challenge that we have, um, I'd like to point out that this is the first national election in the Philippines where foreign policy was an issue with the people. Uh, generally speaking, in our experience, the foreign policy, uh, the ordinary citizen, the ordinary voter, uh, would say, well, foreign policy is not really our concern. Uh, let the uh, experts in government decide that. But when it happens that, we, that our fishermen are not allowed to continue with their livelihood, to fish in areas where they have fished for the last 30, 40 generations, uh, then it becomes an issue right at the gut of our people. And that is where we find ourselves now. I listened carefully to what you said in your remarks about the West Philippine Sea. Um, and your recent stated position of the government in terms of the permanent court of arbitration decision in uh, 2016. So given China's posture, uh, which is at, in recent times, usually not through grey-coloured vessels, that's warships, but through ships of other colours, sometimes Coast Guard vessels and sometimes fishing fleets, and sometimes fishing fleets comprised of hundreds of vessels very close together. Looking ahead for the next couple of years, what would you ask our Chinese friends to do differently? Well, what we have tried, I mean, it, in, in my view, it is, uh, it is uh, nobody wants to go to war. Uh, the one thing we need to avoid is a shooting war. And I have always said that the fundamental principle that guides our foreign policy is peace. Uh, we talk about the economy. We say that we are in crisis. There are many things that we need to do. We have good plans for it. We, have a very we, we are very optimistic about the future. But all of these things will be for naught uh, if there is uh, conflict uh, in the uh, if there is conflict in the in the region. Uh, Australia is certainly a, a strong partner in uh, all of these uh, actuations that we have been trying to endorse. Uh, I, in, in, um, in the case of the Philippines, it's clear that militarily there is no comparison between the Philippines and China in terms of capability, uh, in terms of um, 
uh, of a, uh, strength, uh, military strength, should it come to that. However, we, are, we believe that the strength that we can apply will be from the partnerships, once again, that we have with countries like Australia, with our ASEAN members, with the rest of our, with the rest of our friends and allies in, uh, in the region. And that's why I think that ASEAN is going to have to play a stronger role um, in all of these uh, in all, of, in all of these discussions, and uh, in trying to, again, uh, keep the peace and slowly, in, but continue to engage China. Um, because once that engagement stops, then uh, there is no progress. And then things uh, could uh, very easily deteriorate, and that is not what we want to happen. Uh, so we have tried, uh, when it, when it, uh, on a bilateral basis with China, uh, to, although we maintain our, our position in terms of our maritime territories and maritime, our fishing rights, our um, economic zones, uh, we have nonetheless uh, tried to continue to engage China uh, on, those, on that basis, on those subjects, but also engage China on other aspects, uh, the people-to-people -people relationships, the... Um, uh, even the economic relationships that we have uh, fostered with China, uh, even the uh, some of the some of the other uh, exchanges that we have had in terms of education, in terms of in terms of cultural uh, exchanges, in terms of uh, all of the other things. I I have always uh, uh, told my Chinese friends, and I said, let us not make the um, our differences. Uh, concerning uh, maritime, uh, th like the baselines, the economic zones, etc. Let us not make that the defining element of our relationship, because if that is the only defining relation, if that will be the defining relationship of our, the, the defining part of our relationship, then uh, we are really at a standstill. And hopefully, if we make progress in other areas, this will help. I always quote that the time, the, the way that the United States, for example, and China came together was through ping pong. If you remember, it was because the uh, Chinese uh, ping pong uh, captain well, played with the United States ping pong captain and they became friends and ping pong went to the, China, to the United States. And this led to Richard Nixon going to China and uh, establishing uh, diplomatic relations. So perhaps that's uh, something. So we must explore everything. We must explore every avenue. Uh, we do it G to G, government to government. Basketball? Do, could we do the basketball? Basketball could be, <laughs> could be another, another. But in, in any single way, we never know. You never know uh, where the progress will come. So you have to try everything. You cannot discount uh, anything uh, and uh, uh, limit yourself to... Uh, just the traditional ways of negotiating, the traditional ways of dealing uh, with, sort of, with this kind of problem. Uh, we have to be, uh, to, to an extent, I'd say that we have been successful and that we have slowly begun to redefine, or rather, no, not redefine, but to add uh, to that relationship uh, in other aspects of, of a diplomatic life, of political life uh, within the region. And uh, I think that has happened because of, again, the strong partnerships that we have with the other countries, our allies around the region. And uh, that way, that uh, united front that we can present, uh, I think is a very, very important aspect of that engagement. In your speech before, you also made positive reference to the Quad and AUKUS, and that follows, I think, from the logic you've just explained about uh, those um, beyond the Philippines uh, on whom you can rely for security policy support. Um, your f reflections on how the Quad, for example, uh, aids to strategic stability in the region, uh, that would be of interest, I'm sure, to this audience. And within that, uh, your view and vision of your future relationship with Japan. Well, the uh, Quad certainly is another one of those aggrupations that we feel are going to be. It's a partnership uh, uh, between countries that uh, I think, uh, again, uh, by 
if we were to move as, as a, one country alone, um, it would not be as effective as if we approach the problem as part of these uh, political, uh, diplomatic aggregations, even military aggregations that we have put together. Uh, so that, uh, that's, again, something that is fundamental to uh, the, way we, the way we try to approach the problems that we are facing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, maritime uh, disputes that we have. Um, uh, I have to remind people that uh, these maritime disputes are not only with China. Uh, they, we also have uh, within ASEAN uh, some disputes with our me other member countries. So, but in my view, this applies as well. Uh, so this, this kind, this, these kinds of, of partnerships, I think, are, are very, very important. Now, Japan, uh, so certainly, I had, uh, I had a meeting with uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kishida, just uh, the other day. And um, naturally, I think uh, it's no surprise to anyone that uh, they are terribly, terribly concerned, um, not only of China, but we, because of the recent events, we have focused on uh, the Taiwan situation, um, the visit of the United States uh, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan uh, sort of highlighted once again the simmering tensions that, uh, as I said, were beneath the surface but now have surfaced out into the open. But we, if you remember, if we go back maybe uh, six months, it was North Korea that we were all very worried about. And it is exactly that, uh, that I think, that aspect of it that Japan is also worried about because when you have missiles flying over your, your, in your skies and into the sea, uh, it's not so very surprising that the Japan will, 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 will uh, be alarmed. And again, uh, that is part of uh, the relationship that we have uh, between, uh, between Ally countries, Japan is an ally. Japan is a friend and a partner in many, many ways, again. And that, again, again, we feel that we should strengthen that and continue to, um, we continue to, to promote uh, that partnership. The difference between, the difference between um, right now, anyway, uh, between the conflicts or the disagreements between China and the rest of uh, the countries around the area, and Korea, is Korea has threatened to use nuclear weapons. And that would be a complete disaster. And that it, there is no way that the, that the Philippines will, uh, will be somehow exempt from uh, that sort of conflict. And it's very interesting to watch what's happening in uh, Russia and Ukraine. And it's very worrisome because if there is a possibility that nuclear weapons suddenly become, even tactical nuclear weapons, not strategic nuclear, but tactical nuclear weapons become part of that equation, then we, are, then we will see the normalization of nuclear weapons as, uh, and we will be, it will, nuclear weapons will become conventional weapons. And perhaps that will encourage other nuclear powers to exercise uh, that nuclear uh, option, which, uh, as we all know, uh, is going to be a uh, is, is is the is really end of world scenario. Uh, so, in to to take to take this the point a little further, we have now we are beyond we are beyond the Cold War. Um, we do not I do not subscribe. Uh, to the spheres of influence like we had uh, during the Cold War. Uh, so that, uh, so we, we see that uh, nuclear weapons should not be, we should, not, we should abandon the idea of nuclear weapons as deterrence um, and really work towards bringing down the, uh, the stockpiles of nuclear weapons or, in the world, and with, of course, the, the, the ideal result of them being taken away and uh, us not having, no one having any nuclear weapons. Now, that's easier said than done. That's easier said than done, because each country that has nuclear weapons 
uh, have a different view on the subject and feel that they must have it because uh, uh, they have enemies that they feel that uh, need to be deterred. So that is, uh, I think, where we let, where, where we, where we, go, if we take it as far, that's as far as we can take the the analysis of the conflict. It's something that uh, uh, it is something that we dream, we, that we pray for. Uh, but the way towards that, uh, the way towards that end, uh, certainly is not clear, as there are so many varied and different uh, views on the subject, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the individual the situations of uh, of, those, of those countries that do have nuclear stockpiles. So, this is the thinking that uh, uh, we have um, developed, and this is the thinking that we have tried to espouse to our friends and neighbors. Your comments just now about the legitimization of the use of tactical nuclear weapons, I think, are extraordinarily important. The more of us in the international community who are serving political leaders like yourself who make that clear to our friends in Moscow, mm -hmm. the better. If we cross that threshold, we're into a world of different pain. Um, uh, domestic politics, 60% um, of the vote in your election. Pretty impressive. Um, the best I ever did was 53. Uh, so <laughs> you're obviously a better campaigner than me, my friend. <laughs> so uh, the, um, but on domestic politics, and, uh, and I always head in this direction with all of our guests, I had the Chinese foreign minister here yesterday. Uh, under President Duterte, there were concerns raised about human rights in the Philippines, and particularly in his drugs campaign. Um, some questions uh, today about legal actions against your Nobel laureate um, and Maria Ressa. And then uh, even the State Department report, uh, annual report, refers to uh, several hundred continued political prisoners. So your reflections, I noticed what you said before about uh, unifying all Filipinos. Could you give us your reflections on the future of human rights in the Philippines? Well, the, the argument, or rather the discussion about human rights in the Philippines in the past few years has really derived from the anti-drug war that President Duterte uh, undertook. Uh, and as I, as I come into office, uh, you look and you see we cannot, we cannot stop the drug war. The, the problem continues to exist. What we can do is uh, to examine and learn lessons from the experience in the, uh, from the past administration. And to, be, to, to go into a little more detail, I think we have found, uh, it is certainly my view, that uh, enforcement, uh, which has been the, 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 the part of the drug war that has been, uh, uh, that has been mo most vigorously pursued by President Duterte, uh, only gets you so far. And my approach is uh, slightly different. And uh, we, look on, we look at the drug problem in the Philippines, and it is a significant one. Uh, there are approximately, I suppose, according to official statistics, close to four and a half million actual addicts in the Philippines. And that uh, the, corrosive, the corrosive effect of, uh, on that, on society, uh, on uh, criminality, uh, on the uh, drug syndicates, etc., even the politicization, politicization of the uh, uh, of the whole uh, drug uh, syndicates and their networks, um, is uh, something that we still have to deal with. And so, perhaps we look, we should look at it. We should look instead of just enforcement, which will continue, but in a more focused way. Uh, I tell, I tell when I first came. Uh, with, to my first command conference in, in the, um, uh, in the, in, with, the, with our policemen, and I said, well, "We will, we will adjust. We let us adjust our, our, uh, our focus, and let us also look at prevention. Let us uh, education to our people, to our young people, to say that you know this is a dead end. Uh, this will get you absolutely nowhere. It will get you put in jail. It will get you killed." Uh, and uh, even if it does not do that, this will take away your future. And second part of that is cure, uh, to be more sensitive and more sympathetic to those who actually have gotten caught, enough, caught up in, uh, 
uh, this uh, lifestyle. And so that is uh, something that we are now promoting. We are, we are trying to we are trying to learn which are the best methods now to pull uh, our uh, victims, really is what they are, um, pull them out of that uh, culture uh, and to help them uh, start again and do, uh, live, a, live a, a good life uh, as good and, 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 and constructive members and uh, contributing members of society. Now as to the enforcement, uh, uh, to put it very bluntly, I simply told them, look, I'm not interested in the, uh, in the kid who's, uh, uh, who makes 100 pesos a week selling weed. That's not the person that I, that I want you to go after. I want you to go after people who, if we get them, if we neutralize them, we put them in jail, we put them away, whatever it is, will make an actual difference so that the supply of drugs, the, the, the system of, uh, of distribution, the system of importation of drugs, because much of it really does come from abroad, uh, that, will, that will actually make a difference. It will put a stop to it. And that's what we are working on right now. So those are the different elements of the, uh, those three elements of the, uh, of the anti-drug effort of this government. Uh, though those are, the focus has uh, certainly changed and even the methodology has changed. Well, thank you for that. Um, there was um, the, the Nobel laureate, Maria Ressa. I know there's a, some sort of legal case involving her at the moment. Um, what are the prospects there? Is it caught up in your courts or is it um, uh, there's, because she's, an, she's a Nobel Prize winner, there is international um, preoccupation with her case as well? Well, it, the, it, really what uh, happened with uh, Maria Ressa and Rappler is that it was determined that mm -hmm. it is a... Uh, uh, foreign uh, enterprise, mm -hmm. and that's uh, not allowed in our in our in our rules in our law. And uh, what the, her situation right now is that it has nothing to do with her political leanings. Uh, what has happened is that an individual has filed cyber libel cases against her, and that's what she's facing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the situation with uh, with Maria Ressa. Rappler actually continues to operate. You can uh, you can look them up in um, look them up on uh, on uh, on the internet. Uh, they make their comments and make their posts, and they continue to operate in that way. Um, however, she uh, the the she herself as personally is facing, I believe it's two uh, cyber libel cases, and we just uh, you know we have a very clear delineation of powers in our political system, uh, very much styled after the American system where we have the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, and they're co-equal. And so it is, uh, it is highly improper for the executive to interfere in either the legislature or the judiciary. So the end of UN week uh, here in New York, uh, you've had a bucket load of meetings. Have you had some fun? Uh, well, being in New York is always fun. Uh, uh, I haven't been. <laughs> I I haven't uh, I haven't been in New York for a, a good long time, actually. For for whatever reason, uh, it's been. I think we were looking. We were we were, uh, we were calculating it with my wife Lisa, who is here. Uh, we were calculating, what, 22 years since we came back to New York? Put your hands together for the First Lady of the Philippines. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's been 22 years. She practiced law here for many years. Uh, and so she's really uh, part of that song. She's a native New Yorker. Um, and we missed it. We... We missed it terribly. Um, I spent a good deal of time as well in New York, uh, perhaps in not, not as a permanent resident or working here, but um, simply because uh, I learned to, to enjoy and uh, really have great affection for the city and its people. And uh, we missed it terribly, and we were very happy to be given the chance uh, to come back. But about, we'll, I... Um, I would say that she has uh, been had a better opportunity to have some fun in New York. Uh, we, we've been, we've been, we've been. I have tried very hard to maximize every single 
uh, hour that uh, I've been here to make these contacts, and as you <laughs> described them, I have a bucket load of, me of meetings, which I think have gone rather well. But as I said, uh, it's uh, not, uh, it doesn't take much uh, just to be able to look, at the, look out my window and to see New York, uh, the Central Park, uh, to see New York at night, uh, to walk along the street, uh, to uh, get my sabrette and my souvlaki sandwich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go to Cats, have a pastrami on rye. Uh, Did you and, go to Essa Bagels to get your and, bagels? And I'm a happy camper. It mm. Doesn't take well, much. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have much the same sentiment about this town. <laughs> yeah, for a small town, it's not bad. You know, yeah. <laughs> the um, Mr. President, uh, as you said, you and General Assembly Week, I always found to be a bit like speed dating for heads of government. You know, <laughs> in the door, out the door, in the door, out the door. Um, you are such a welcome guest here at the Asia Society. Um, our centre in uh, Manila, he headed by Doris Ho. Put your hands together for Doris. Uh, we're a global family. We have 15 centres around the world, and uh, including in Australia, but we have five centres here in America. You are always a welcome guest here because we wish your country, the Philippines, all the best for the future. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kevin Rudd, for those... Very kind words, and thank you all, uh, members of the Asia Society, for this very warm welcome that you have given me. Thank you very much indeed.